<clears throat> Hi, everyone. Welcome to our talk, um, When Dataverse Meets OpenStack Cloud Dataverse. So quick show of hands, how many of you here attended the talk on Monday given by Mercer and Oren and PNI on Cloud Dataverse? OK. <laughs> um, it's fine if you didn't. Um, this is going to review some of that and then go into more detail. Um, but it, had you been there, the last slide that they ended on was on this one, which says data repositories needs clouds, clouds need data repositories, and that with the Cloud Dataverse project, we combine the power and scalability of OpenStack Cloud with the need to access data using a feature-rich repository. Um, their talk was more focused on the strategy and the need. Ours is going to be more details about what Dataverse is and then the technical implementation of what we've done. So I'm here with my colleagues Leonid, um, and then from the Mass Open Cloud, Jeremy. I'm Gustavo. I'm the tech lead on the Dataverse project. I'm going to start giving some intro into Dataverse, its features, and the technology we've used. Then Leonid will tell a little bit about what we've done to add OpenStack support to Dataverse. And then Jeremy will give a demo of the Cloud Dataverse in practice and discuss the architecture of, of that. Um, we'll end on some future considerations and questions if we have time at the end. OK, so Dataverse is an open source platform to share archive and archive data. It's developed by us at IQSS at Harvard, and we've been working on it since about 2006. In the 10 years or so we've worked on it, we realized that there's lots of different people who want repositories for their data and have lots of different needs and use cases. So when we re-architected the project about four years ago, one of the things we made sure to do was to build support for lots of different types of users, lots of different di types of data, and the different workloads that they all need. Um, we develop it with funding by IQSS, but we also get funding from grants, and we work with collaboration with a lot of different institutions, including, for example, in this case, the Mass Open Cloud at BU. Our core development team is 13, and it's developers, we have designers, we have UI, UX people, um, we have a metadata specialist, we have a curation manager, we have a project manager, and me as a tech lead. It's an open source project, and so with that, we develop the software ourselves, and we run one of the installations, but there are 22, actually, this map is a little outdated. There are now 23. We got a new installation in Indonesia last week um, who are running the software and versions of the software. In addition, besides having the community to use the software, we also have a lot of code contributions from outside our core team. So up to now, I think we've had about 38 code contributors. And we have hundreds of members of the community who are all interested, the developers, the researchers, the librarians, the data scientists. And we have several different communication channels with which we inter interact with them on a daily and weekly basis. Um, there's a Dataverse Google group mailing list that is active, and people email and respond. And it's nice because when we first started the list, we usually were the ones to respond. But as the community has grown, a lot of times other members of the community answer before we even get to it and are able to help each other out. And the community is itself is growing. Um, we provide bi-weekly Dataverse community calls where anyone who's interested in the topic that we're going to discuss that week calls in, and we also have an open forum for questions then. And we have an annual Dataverse community meeting, which if any of you are interested in this, it's going to be next month in June, um, June 14, 15, and 16, and across the river in Cambridge. So if you're interested, let me know afterwards and I can get you information. Um, so this slide is just a link. It's a link to our roadmap. Uh, when we have long more time, we click into the roadmap, and we look at details of what we're working on in the future. Um, but I wanted to put it in here so that if you later decide to look at the slides in more detail, you can click on it and look at it yourself. Um, but I'm going to focus on more just what's there now and not the roadmap. That gives more time to these guys to get into the more technical, interesting details. OK, so some of the features that Dataverse provides. And a lot of this, if you want to go back to that earlier point where it's built around multiple different kinds of users and data and workflows. So a lot of the features are built in ways that are meant to be dynamic or able to support these different kinds of needs that our users have. Um, so we have multiple ways of signing in. We have a native authentication system, but then we also are able to sign in with Shibboleth if you want to sign in with your institution. Um, and we also have OAuth support, so for things like GitHub and um, Orchid and Google, you can log in with that. We provide different ways to do branding so that each installation can brand as their own installation. So even though they're running the same software, it'll look different, and they'll be able to put their logos and their information and links to their project sites and things like that. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Dataverses within Dataverses in the next slide. Um, I'll explain a little more what a Dataverse container is and how that works, but I have a couple nice diagrams that a colleague drew up. Um, 
One of the things that's important in the data publishing world is to have citations. So our software automatically generates citations for your, for your data. And as you make changes and create new versions, the citation version number will change so that people know which version of the data that they are citing and referencing. We support domain-specific metadata. So this was a key one in that even though we have created it coming out of a social science institute, we wanted to make sure that the software would be able to be used by researchers and scientists and users of all different domains. So we built a very dynamic, flexible system to be able to create metadata blocks, basically is what we call them, um, of different kinds of metadata. So by default, when you install a Dataverse, you have the citation metadata block. And then that, one, that one's very important and is required because it's used to build the automatically generated citations. But then you can also use a social science block, an astronomy block. Um, we've worked with the biomedical group to have a biomed block. And the software is built to be able to support to easily upload and add new blocks as we work with different experts in their domains to, to figure out what standards they use for their metadata. And so any individual installation of Dataverse can support multiple domains, whichever domains they're most interested in. At Harvard Dataverse, for example, we are open to data from everywhere, so we have all the blocks enabled. Um, as I mentioned earlier with the citation, we have versioning, and so we have you can have minor versions and major versions of your data, and so if you add new files, for example, you'll create a new major version. But if you're, all you did was fix a typo, maybe it's just a minor version, it's version 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 et cetera. Um, we have a lot of the different publishing workflows. And this was important because we have use cases where individual researchers want to have their own data verses and have full control and publish their own data sets. But then we also have a similar, a different use case, excuse me, um, of journals where they want to maintain the publishing control. So they allow people to contribute and upload data sets, but the final authority on publishing relies, is on the journal themselves, and the people who upload the data cannot do the publishing. Um, but there's a workflow mechanism there for that when it's ready for publishing, they send it to the curator who then reviews it and then can either publish it or send it back to the author. Um, one thing that was also very important to us with our re-architecture was to provide robust APIs. So we have the web application that we'll talk a little bit more about the technology there in a minute. Um, but we also created a lot of robust APIs so that anything that you can do via the web app, you can do via the APIs and you can build your own UI, you can do automated things. We have a lot of partnerships with different groups which use the API for um, ingesting new data into the system and or for downloading and, things, and searching and things like that. And then the last feature that I'll talk about here is harvesting. And that's the idea of getting metadata from other installations of Dataverse and other institutions. So we use what's called OAI PMH, which is Open Archive Initiative. Um, and it's basically a standard that's used for this kind of thing where as updates are made to the data, it will tell the client that the updates are there. And so, for example, Harvard Dataverse, we go ahead and we harvest from all the other Dataverse installations that we can, and also from non-Dataverse but other installation, institutions that use OAI. So when you search at the Harvard Dataverse, you can search for metadata not just from us but from everywhere that we harvest from. And other, other installations are doing the same thing. There's one of our partners in Odom also does a lot of harvesting of everything. And so it just makes the data much more discoverable because you don't have to go specifically to the place that's hosted to find it. OK, so this is the schematic I was talking about. Um, so a Dataverse, you can think of basically as a container. And one of the things we realized is that to be able to model the different types of institutions and researchers, we needed to be able to be flexible and have containers within containers. So a Dataverse originally would, was created to hold data sets, but now we modified it to also hold dataverses. So dataverse can contain multiple dataverses, each of which could contain other dataverses, and then all of those levels can contain different data sets. And the idea is, if you're an individual researcher, for example, maybe you have your dataverse and you have your 5, 10, 15 data sets in there. But if you're an institution, maybe you create one high-level dataverse, and then below it you create individual dataverses for the researchers and things like that. Again, using our installation, because that's the one I know best. At Harvard, we have a high-level Harvard Dataverse. And then within there, we have different Dataverses for all the different um, institutions that want to put their data on Harvard. And then within those data set, the Dataverses, they might have more control and create some sub-Dataverses or just upload their data sets directly. Um, but the core of the guts, I would say, is the data set itself. That's what contains the collection of data files and supporting files that you want to make available to the uh, community, and also contains metadata describing that data set. And that's where we talked about the different dynamic metadata to be able to richly describe the, the data that you have. 
Okay, so this is our technical stack. Basically, we, being open source, we use open source products. Um, we use GlassFish Server 4.1. It's a web application. Um, and in using GlassFish, it means we're able to use the latest Java SE 8. Uh, Java SE 9 is coming out soon, and hopefully we'll upgrade to that sometime within the next year. Um, but right now, we're on Standard Edition 8. And then we heavily leverage the Enterprise Edition, that's what EE stands for, of Java EE 7. So Java EE 7 is composed of lots of different modules, and so we use things for all different, for the presentation layer, for the business layer, for the storage layer. So for the presentation, we use Java server faces and a RESTful API stuff. For business, we use EJBs a lot, and we're able to create transactions asynchronous for like things when you ingest large files, it can take longer, so we can return feedback to the user sooner. Timers for things that we want to run overnight and are also longer run processes. Um, the back end, we store with JPA, it's Java Persistence Architecture, and we use Bean Validation to make sure that the data that gets into the database is valid. Um, but what's important related to this talk mostly is the storage. So our data and the metadata is all stored, for example, in the Postgres data, database. We use Solar for indexing and search, and then, the files themselves either live on the file system or what we've added with this collaboration is now they can live in a Swift object store. So now I'm gonna pass you along to Leonid and he's gonna tell you more about what we've done to add this support. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm Leonid. Um, so I'm going to be talking about what it is that we had to do to add this OpenStack support to our application. Um, so uh, one part of it is uh, direct ac access to cloud computing. Um, this relationship between uh, Dataverse and MOC, the goal of it was not to like merge our applications uh, and or to like uh, duplicate to duplicate functionality in both places. Uh, it was to bring the expertise that we already have together and like really set. Um, so for example, the, um, as um, we're talking about direct access to cloud computing, uh, we have massive amounts of expertise in publishing, in accumulating metadata, in allowing people to make their research discoverable with other institutions. But um, now some of our uh, researchers want to allow their users to run uh, computations on their data. We don't have any infrastructure for that, and we didn't want to get into business of implementing that. So that's where MOC essentially comes into. They already have that infrastructure, and uh, um, basically this access to cloud computing really is a fancy way of saying that we are sending our users to, to, their, to their side. Uh, some interactions between our software platforms need to happen for that. We need to provide some metadata describing just what kind of data files we have in this data set. They need to provide certain amount of metadata explaining what kind of facilities they have. But once that, that exchange happens, we basically just tell our user, um, click this button and off you go to, to the MOC. So I'm not even going to talk about this part much because uh, Jeremy is going to be describing it in much detail and uh, he's going to show it in his demo. And I'll be talking about the second part, the storage driver, because that's uh, the part I was working on. Um, so again, in our, it's a kind of very, very simple uh, schematic diagram explaining what happens uh, as we store our files in normal operations. Our users upload uh, files, they get stored on some like local file system, some giant uh, file system appliance. Uh, of course, there is a level of, there is a level of uh, abstraction that like separates the actual physical like storage hardware from, from the application. Um, and there are some drivers that implement that storage and a certain amount of metadata about each file is stored in a database that basically that tells the application what, uh, that tells the uh, data file reader and writer layer like how, what driver needs to be used to access a certain file. So we provide the, uh, our like normal standard default uh, file system storage driver. There is a read only um, storage driver for, for accessing files on remote HTTP servers. So basically we had to add another driver that provides um, read-write access to Swift storage. 
Um, there wasn't much code really, and um, none of it implementing this was not exactly rocket science, and that's the main message of this talk, is that basically we were able to, to <coughs> add this um, access to, to very significant amounts of functionality to our users with relatively little code and uh, like very straightforward code at that. Um, so the way it's done, I mean, the data file I.O. is uh, like a very standard abstract interface with um, that individual drivers implement. Uh, so it's like stand your standard Java uh, inheritance. And we define certain methods that you need to read and write your files. We, you can get like a, a Java and I.O. channel. You can get input or output streams. Uh, and as an example, um, I know this, uh, this is a fairly useful call, like, called like save path. If you have a file, usually in, in our workflow scenario, a user uploads a file, it gets dumped on a, temp in a, on a temporary file system, and then when you're ready to save it permanently, you call, you call this and it ends up in its final location. So this is the implementation for the file system. Really, it really ends up being implemented as a, basically as a one line as a one line of uh, Java and I.O. code. Uh, it translates one-to-one -to, -one to this like files.copy method. And for Swift, um, we ended up basically implementing the same thing with, again, with just one line of, uh, of, uh, of just, uh, Java code, um, this upload object call. So again, it's like it's really equally, it's similarly straightforward pretty much throughout uh, that added Swift storage implementation. And uh, again, just to illustrate it, like to our users, uh, you know, looking, going to our interface, looking at files, uh, it's totally transparent. One of these files happens to be stored on the local file system, the other one on Swift, they both look the same to our users. Um, like it's, but the database that stores the metadata, like describing these files, just happens to, um, to mention the actual physical location of the file, and that's enough for, for the storage layer to know where to look to, for the file. And it just happens to work. Um, so basically, there, there are two basic scenarios for that. Yeah, we, we allow our users to go to the application and like, upload their files the way they normally would. Uh, and just like have the files like magically ending up getting stored on Swift. The other scenario is that somebody may already have a massive amount of data on Swift and we just provide them with a way to um, import, import the files uh, into the into Dataverse and just making them discoverable and available through our normal, uh, with our normal functionality. And uh, you know, for again, for Local files, files end up being stored on the file system for Swift, they end up being stored on Swift. And with some, like in this, I'm really just showing the like, directory listings uh, right now, it's not particularly exciting, but um, it shows among other things that for, file, for certain files we generate like additional uh, um, real time permutations that we call like derivative files. So for an image file, we'll generate automatically a few uh, thumbnails in different sizes. So again, like for a file stored on the cloud, these uh, thumbnails just like were magically generated and uh, stored there. And it just works transparently without any interactions with the user. And on this note, um, Passing this to Jeremy, who will talk about the MOC side of this collaboration. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leonid. Uh, so now I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, Cloud Dataverse uh, in practice. Um, in particular, the consequences and benefits of the changes we've made to Dataverse to become Cloud Dataverse. And um, to illustrate these points, uh, I'll be referencing the pilot implementation of Cloud Dataverse at the Mass Open Cloud. Uh, so this is the um, architecture that we've inherited. Um, so you'll notice right away that it's not particularly helpful to users who want to um, actually analyze the data in Dataverse using compute. Uh, so whenever you see those blue arrows, that represents the transfer of data sets. 
So in this case, um, with the existing dataverse architecture, um, the data sets have to go over the internet first before you can analyze them using compute. So this isn't um, very overtly pleasant, and there's definitely not much incentiv incentivization for analysis, and really, it's not too convenient. Uh, so one sort of intermediate step we can take to improve this a little is at least if we swap out a, a traditional file system for object store, we can at least store uh, some larger objects. Uh, but what follows from this is now, um, essentially now um, the compute platform uh, can now access the data sets uh, stored in Dataverse uh, directly. So now already the workflow is much more simple and convenient and we're starting to see some incentivization. Uh, so right now, um, at this point, the architecture that you see is probably suitable just for uh, smaller data sets. You could um, imagine a user spinning up a single VM and then they could use a programming language like R or a Python library like scikit-learn to analyze data sets. Probably you know, not too big, but at least it's convenient for them to get started. Uh, luckily though, um, since we were using OpenStack, uh, it was easy enough to integrate a big data analytics platform as well um, through the use of OpenStack Sahara. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Sahara, um, it's basically a component of OpenStack that offers big data cluster provisioning. And this allows users to run uh, big data applications using Hadoop, Spark, Pig, Hive, and Storm. Uh, in particular, uh, Hadoop, Spark, and Pig were of particular uh, interest to us because they offer the tightest integration with the Swift object store. Um, Sahara also offers um, a simple abstraction for job submission, so we didn't want to have to you know, force our users to be messing around with the command line just to do their analytics work. And um, as I mentioned, um, with, um, with, uh, with the applications launched by Sahara, the Swift integration for job input and output works right out of the box. Uh, so it was definitely um, important to introduce this um, extra layer um, or service in our architecture since the convenience and locality that we've been stressing is uh, very important um, at this scale, especially when you're talking about um, really uh, terabytes or you know, theoretically petabytes of data. So growing out of that same idea of trying to scale this solution, um, when you're dealing, like I said, with terabytes, um, it helps to have uh, essentially a centralized storage solution. So if you think about it, if everyone's trying to access um, the same thing, why should they have to copy you know, the whole thing in its entirety before they do their work? Um, and this is um, especially um, a useful notion when you compare it to the sort of more traditional approach uh, with HDFS, where the user is responsible for copying um, all the data into their compute environment first. Uh, especially with that approach, uh, the user will probably want to persist their compute environment uh, between job executions, which is a big burden to the user and will probably end up you know, costing them money. But um, with a centralized storage solution, now they, the user can take advantage of you know, transient compute, transient um, data processing clusters. Uh, and then if you're worried about the performance of you know, running big data applications that uh, access Swift, um, there's definitely some performance improvements to be made. Uh, if you stick around for the talk, which immediately follows this, you can learn more about some of those improvements. Uh, so there's still um, something missing from this architecture. Um, in particular, um, when designing this system, we needed something really to tie everything together, um, really that could offer um, tight and specific integration with the surrounding services. Um, so for example, with um, guiding through job submission with Sahara. Uh, I mean, really for the workflow we were trying to introduce, everything was a little bit too manual. Um, so we basically introduced a new user interface, which we call GG, which was, I mean, designed with simplicity as a primary goal and um, essentially offers single-click interoperability between the Dataverse UI and with Horizon. So just as um, an example of what we're talking about, uh, on the left you can see our process for launching a, a data processing cluster with Sahara. So we basically just preserve uh, the most important options to the user. But then on the right you can see what the sort of upstream Sahara dashboard looks like. So, I mean, we're not, we're not trying to, you know, reject or replace the Sahara dashboard, but they're, you know, an upstream UI trying to cater to every possible use case. But in our system, we're trying to emphasize uh, simplicity and convenience. So Sahara dashboard was not really satisfactory for our use case. Um, so it is worth noting that this um, 
final component, GG, which, we, which we've introduced, um, is an entirely optional piece of the cloud data versus ecosystem, and it's certainly not the only solution uh, for this use case. It, you know, it's possible to imagine this being done with either some other new UI or with a modified form of Horizon. Right, so at this point, um, you can see, um, we're gonna go through a quick demo of everything that we've discussed um, in action. Uh, so this is the Dataverse UI, and so from here you can uh, browse data sets. Uh, if you click on one, you should be able to see uh, the files in that data set and some citation and other publication info as, along with the description. Uh, so you can see um, right off the bat, you can just, um, we provide the container name, so if you have the ability to just access that directly, you can go right into that. Otherwise, you have the compute button and we'll um, redirect you to GG and help you with um, getting set up with, with Sahara. And then if you um, click on one of the files, um, again, you can see the compute button. And if you scroll down, we do preserve the original functionality by the original Dataverse project, which is just the direct download. So you can still do that with this new project as well. Um, finally, if you do click the compute button, you'll be redirected to Gigi. And so from here, you can immediately uh, launch a new cluster, or if you already have one, you can just use that. Um, so um, if I click on it. Uh, you can see that, like I was mentioning, we've only preserved essentially the most important option, which is, you know, what software would you like to run on the cluster and the size of the cluster. And you do have to, provi have to provide a name, and that's really it. So you can see that the cluster's been launched. And if you switch over to Horizon, you can see if the cluster is now spawning. If you switch back to GG now, you're now ready to launch a job. So you can see that the container name containing your uh, selected data set has been uh, pre-populated after you click the compute button. So now to run the job, um, all you have to do is say um, which cluster you'd like to run the job on, uh, which type of job. And uh, in this example, we're using word count, but eventually we'll have the option to upload, uh, the user can upload their own files, their own job templates. Uh, finally, you do have to provide the input and output. If you just put a wildcard there, that indicates that you want to analyze every file in, in the data set. And then you have to provide um, the container where you want to see the output of your job as well. So you can see now that the job has been uh, successfully submitted. And then if you go, if we go back to Horizon, you can see that now First the job will be pending and then it should switch to running pretty quick. And then you can observe the status of the job uh, from the Sparkmaster UI. You can see if I refresh, now the application is now listed under running applications. And it's a pretty small data set, so pretty soon you can see the output um, in the container that you specified. And you can see the job completed successfully and then you can download your results. So some future considerations uh, for this project. Uh, we'd like to implement a metadata system so um, you can know which files are actually computable. Uh, we've observed a lot of people who publish data sets on a platform like Dataverse often have things that aren't designed to be consumed by the compute engine, so like things like a PDF report or even just sample outputs of previous analytic work. Um, we're also looking um, towards better container permissions. Um, we're tr part of the goal, especially if you came uh, to the talk on Monday, is that we're trying to move uh, beyond just simple public data sets. I mean, not every researcher wants to just have total, you know, unrestricted access to what they're working on. Um, we're also looking towards um, a common identity provider between Dataverse and OpenStack, so your Dataverse account can be your OpenStack account. And this will, I mean, it'll make everything more seamless and just help tie everything together. Um, we're also investigating the ability to share your job binaries or other analytic scripts, uh, you know, paired with a data set directly. So, for example, if um, you wanted to replicate the results of a paper, you could just jump right into that in your compute environment immediately. Um, and then on that same note, we're looking into providing um, a similar workflow that we have for big data that can work for um, smaller data sets. So, like, that was um, the idea with the smaller VM running something like R or scikit-learn. And then finally, we have this sort of more novel idea of um, a shopping cart when you're browsing the data sets. So you could imagine um, if you have a you know, very popular dataverse with lots of data sets published, you could actually choose to analyze content from 
multiple data sets. So that's something we're thinking about in the future. Uh, at this point, um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to come up, use the microphone. Um, we're happy to answer anything. That was really neat. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I really liked how simple it was for you to integrate Swift into the existing work uh, that you had. What I was curious about is I noticed that you were doing that inside of Java. So what Swift client were you using for that? What library, client library? Uh, the, the standard Swift, um, I mentioned it in, in um, yeah, you can go back. Um, the library is called uh, JAWS. Oh, so okay. that's a, a lot of people have been using that with pretty good success. Okay, great, thanks. So J Java Swift and JAWS are like used interchangeably. And I'll show you the actual name of it, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I missed that part right there, yeah. Okay. Great, thanks. So I just have, when you were running the job before, yeah. what was, was that, uh, what language was that in? Was that in SQL? Was it in Java? So that was, was it pre-written? Oh, sorry. That was, um, that was a Spark application written in, um, in Scala. Any more questions? Anything else I can clarify? We have plenty of time. Oh, sometime. All right, uh, thank you guys. Thank you.